We had a fantastic time yesterday at the block party. A fantastic turnout, 25 to 30 people registered. Families registered, not people, but families registered that were non-church going people, people that don't go to our church. And uh, we're just excited. We were able to make contact with a lot of people. A lot of people promised that they would come and visit. The one thing I heard on two separate occasions was, you know, my church is boring. So I was talking to one lady and I said, well, we've been, you know, a lot of things have been said about our church, but one thing for sure has never been said is that we're boring. So she's like, man, I'm excited. She goes, hopefully she'll be here today, maybe for a second service. But hey, amen. I'm thankful that we don't go to a boring church. Amen. God is alive. He's not dead. The spirit starts moving. We're excited. I'm just so thankful for Sister Rachel, Brother Don, for all the hard work they did and their crew, everybody that helped move tables, worked the booth, you know, went out door knocking at whatever time they didn't do yesterday. A couple of people came. I was asking them, how did you hear about the block party? Some people said Facebook. Some people were friends of so-and-so. But we, there was a few there that said, you know, there were some people that were walking through the neighborhood passing out flyers. So I'm just excited about what God is doing and believing great things for that. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to get a lot of scriptures today. Proverbs 23 and 23 to begin with. Amen. We're going to start a, a series on doctrine. And so we're going to begin today uh, with the first lesson on that. Just lay a little bit of a foundation this morning and then get into baptism if we have time. Amen. I'm not going to race through anything, but we're going to get into baptism and uh, a few lessons now, we'll talk about the Holy Ghost, we'll talk about doctrines of devils and what the Bible says about contrary doctrines and, and the doctrines of the one saved, always saved, and how that came about and, and all that good stuff. So we're going to go ahead and, and go at some of this stuff for a few weeks here today. Well, not today, but in the next coming weeks. Proverbs 23, 23, the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. I, we spoke about this at the beginning when we talked about the, the Godhead and the oneness of God. We need to find what the truth is and seek it out. We need to purchase it. And once we have the truth, we are to hold on to it with everything that we have in order to find the truth. I know that we talked about this when we did the, the oneness of God. Lay aside everything that you think you know, everything that you've been taught if you've been to multiple churches. Lay aside all that stuff that we know to be true and start with a clear mind. We're going to search the scriptures. The Bible says for in them you think you have eternal life. We're going to search the scriptures. We're going to search history. We're going to go through that and see what really is the truth and what God requires of us in order to be saved. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 15, study to show thyself approved of, to God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Romans 15 said, for whatsoever things are written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The reason why we need to understand why we believe what we believe is because people ask, why do you believe that? Why do you do this? Why do you baptize in Jesus' name? Why do you believe you need the Holy Ghost to be saved? Why do you believe that you have to speak in tongues in order to have the Holy Ghost? And, you know, we get asked question after question and and, and for some of us that have been in church for years, some of us still can't answer those questions. They, they understand that I have the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. I was baptized in Jesus' name. But we can't, you know, we can say, well, it says in Acts 2.38. But it's good to have more ammunition for that. More than just saying, well, Peter said, or then repent to be baptized. Yeah, that's what he said. But the Bible says it in multiple places why we need to be baptized, how we need to be baptized. Talking about the Holy Ghost. Talking about a lot of different things. History clearly defines a lot of what we believe. You know, this isn't something that was started a few hundred years ago by some guy that had a dream and all of a sudden came out with a new doctrine. Our doctrine goes all the way back to the time of Jesus walking on this earth. And if we can begin to understand that and where some of these other thoughts and where some of these other concepts came about... If we just trace it all the way back, we have the truth, but we need to understand why we do these things and have an answer for why we do these things. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3.15, sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh 
you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to always be ready to give an answer. You know, you may be at work and somebody may ask you a question. You've got to be ready to give an answer to somebody. You may be in a family reunion. You may be in a lot of different places. And they may ask you, why do you believe? Why do you do this? We need to always be ready to give an answer to them. 2 Timothy 3.14, but continue thou, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We need to understand things that have been taught. This is not something, like I just said, this is not something that has been created a few hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. This is something, the very, uh, when Jesus walked on this earth and the apostles went, he, they taught what Jesus taught. We're going to get into some of that here. So we're going to start going into baptism. So what is the important? Well, first off, we are apostolic. You know, or we are first apostolic church. We believe in the apostle doctrine. And apostolic basically means following after the apostles. A lot of people say, well, why don't you, you know, Jesus and why, you know, do all these things. Why do we follow the apostle doctrine? Well, the apostles taught what Jesus taught. So it wasn't that Peter, when he got up on the day of Pentecost, he didn't say anything that was contrary to what Jesus taught. When Jesus was on this earth, he was baptized, believed in repentance, and he believed in the Holy Ghost, but that wasn't poured out yet because Jesus was still on this earth. The Bible says, Jesus said, Behold, I will bring the Comforter to you when I go away. I'm going to go away, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I will send my spirit back. So that's why people weren't receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost while Jesus was walking on this earth because they had Jesus there in front of them. They didn't need the Holy Ghost. They didn't need the Comforter. But when he went away and resurrected, they tarried in, in Jerusalem in the upper room. And we know Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, the Holy Ghost was poured out. And we saw a lot of people saved. Not we didn't see it, but they saw a lot of people saved. So baptism. Let's look at what the Bible says, what history says about Water baptism. I'm not going to talk about spirit baptism today. We're going to talk about water baptism. So, what is the importance of baptism? What is the formula for baptism? And what is the purpose for it? Baptism is from the Greek word baptizo or bapto, which means to immerse, cover fully with fluid, especially water, to dip or to wash. Just through the definition alone of baptism, we understand that we cannot be sprinkled in order to be baptized. Because by definition, baptism is to be covered, to be immersed, to dip, especially with water. So if that word means that, then we should probably do that. John chapter 3, verse number 23. John chapter 3, verse 23. The Bible says John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem. Because there was much water there, and they came, and they were baptized. Mark chapter 1, 9 through 10, the Bible says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized of John in Jordan. Straightway came up out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit like a dove descending from him. We notice in John chapter 3, that John was baptizing in Anon near Salem. Why was he baptizing there? There wasn't a specific reason. Well, if you go right after the comma, it gives you the answer. Because there was much water there. If, if you didn't have, if we didn't have to be submerged, if we didn't have to be fully covered by the water, there was no reason for John to go to a place where there was much water. He would otherwise they could turn on the faucet, go to a well, take a bucket. He could have baptized people anywhere. But he chose this place specifically because there was much water there. Because John understood if we were going to be baptized, we had to be fully covered. Mark chapter 1, we find that Jesus of Nazareth was there, baptized John in Jordan. In verse number 10, straightway coming up out of the water. Meaning that he had to have been in the water for him to come up out of the water. Jesus himself wasn't sprinkled, but he was fully submerged in the water. And then he saw the heavens open, the spirit descending like a dove. So we find in these scriptures, in the Gospel of John, there was much water. Jesus came out because there was much water. And we find harmony among the scriptures concerning the proper baptismal formula. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. We all know this, and you've heard this, 
multiple times. If you have ever uh, witnessed, if you've read the book of Matthew, people say, well, why do you baptize in Jesus' name? Because the Bible clearly states in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, we talked about this a few months ago. We talked about the oneness of God. But for the sake of people that were not here, he says, first off, go teach and baptize. He tells them the formula. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. One name. Not names, not titles, but one name. If you look at it, the Bible talks about, well, let me get ahead of myself. Luke chapter 24, verse number 45. Then opened he their understanding that he might understand the scriptures. The apostles. If you read, and we're going to get into this here in a minute, but the apostles and those present had their understanding open to the fact of the scriptures. There was understanding there. Also, we are going to find here in just a moment that history itself has lost it in translation. That this scripture itself was changed. If you look at it, well, let's just go. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 and 38. We'll get to that in a second. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus and he have crucified both the Lord and Christ. Now this is Peter. He's on the day of Pentecost. He's anointed. He's preaching. All these, these people heard them speaking in tongues. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And he's in the middle towards the end of his sermon here. And he says, verse number 37, when they heard this, the crowd around them who Peter was talking to, they were pricked in their hearts and other Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the message about Jesus Christ. After they heard Christ and Him crucified, they asked, What shall we do? Peter says, First, you must repent, and then be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. So Peter tells us two things. One, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And two, that everybody should be baptized. But Jesus said, baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Peter said, baptize him in the name of the Lord Jesus. So did Peter obey or did Peter disobey? There is a contradiction. So Jesus says one thing, Peter says the other. So which one should we do? Should we baptize in the titles or should we baptize or the Trinity or should we baptize in Jesus' name? Acts chapter 8, verse number 16. This is all throughout the New Testament. For as yet as he was fallen upon them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know in Acts chapter 2, he said be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10, verse 48. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they prayed him to tarry certain days. Acts chapter 19, verse number 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in the book of Acts, we find four different instances. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 8, verse 16. Acts chapter 10, verse 48. And Acts chapter 19, verse 5. That they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. There is no other place, there is no place in the Bible that says you must be baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Except for Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. So it sounds like a great contradiction. But let's look at history. The Catholic Encyclopedia 2, page... 263 summarizes the following. This is a direct quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the phrase Father, Son, and Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit by the Catholic Church in the second century. On this page, the Catholic Church acknowledges and agrees that baptism was originally performed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the early church and even references that fact to the book of Acts, but was simulated throughout time. Additionally, if you look at page 263 in their encyclopedia, the page offers various formulas that were practiced by certain sects throughout time, though only one prevailed among mainstream Christianity. Thus, merely quoting a simple phrase is what replaced the original method of the apostles' baptism that was confirmed on the day of Pentecost. 
Pentecost and found in heaven. If you look at the Catholic Encyclopedia, it mentions that they changed the phrase from Jesus Christ to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they acknowledged the fact that they changed it in the second century. This wasn't something that dates back to the apostles and dates back to Jesus Christ. They admittedly say, we change the scriptures. And the Bible clearly warns us that if we change the scriptures, if we add to the scriptures, he is going to add to the plagues that is coming on later on. And if we subtract from the scriptures, that he is going to take our name from the book of life. They admittedly say that we change the formula from Jesus' name to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is a very dangerous thing to do. Catholic Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger said this, the basic form of Matthew 28, 19, Trinitarian profession of faith, took shape during the course of the second and third centuries in connection with the ceremony of baptism. So far as its place of origin is concerned, the text of Matthew 28, 19, therefore did not originate from the original church that started in Jerusalem around AD 33. It was rather as the evidence proves a later invention of Roman Catholicism completely fabricated. Very few know about these historical facts. It's a direct quote from Catholic Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. He's not saying that Matthew 28, 19 is false, but he's saying the version that you read in the Bible is false. It is completely fabricated in his own words. If you look at the Demonstratio Evangelica by Eusebius, quotes Matthew 28, 19, as he sees the original manuscripts, he looked at the original manuscript in its unaltered form in the library of Caesarea. His testimony, and I quote, with one word in voice, he said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations in my name, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In the original manuscript, this man, Eusebius, said, It does not say, Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The original text says, Jesus said, Go baptize them in my name. So we know we must baptize in Jesus' name. The Shaft Kurtzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. Gee, and I quote, Jesus, however, cannot have given his disciples this Trinitarian order of baptism after his resurrection. For the New Testament knows only one baptism in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 2.38, Acts chapter 8.16, Acts chapter 10.43, Acts 19 and 5, Galatians 3.27, Romans 6.3, 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through 15. This is all part of his quote. Which still occurs even in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. While the Trinitarian formula occurs only in Matthew 28.19, and then again in the Didache 7.1 and Justin Apollo 1 verse 61. Finally, distinctly, Litur or liturgical character of the formula is strange. It was not the way of Jesus to make such formulas. The formula, the formal authenticity of Matthew 28, 19 must be disputed. That's on page 435 of his Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. Jerusalem Bible says this. It may be that this formula, the triune, Matthew 28, 19, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, so far as the fullness of its expression is concerned, is a reflection of a man-made uh, man usage established later for in the primitive Catholic community. It will be remembered that Acts speaks of baptizing in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. But he said it's a reflection of man-made ideas. We cannot afford to base our salvation on man-made ideas. Jesus Christ himself laid down a foundation and laid down a formula all throughout his life of what it took to be saved and what it took to dwell in his presence. And we cannot afford to alter what the word of God says. We need to follow it exactly how Jesus meant it as exactly how the apostles preached it and how we are taught it today. Cannot afford to mess with this stuff. The
International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Volume 4, page 2637. If you look under the word baptism, it says Matthew 28, 19, in particular, only canonizes a later ecclesiastical situation. That its universalism is contrary to the facts of early Christian history. And its Trinitarian formula is foreign to the mouth of Jesus. Jesus didn't know anything else but himself. He didn't know anything else but one God. And here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And thou shalt love him with all your heart, all your mind, your soul, your body, and strength. So the Trinitarian formula of baptism was foreign to the mouth of Jesus. New Revised Standard Version says this about Matthew 28, 19. Modern critics claim this formula is falsely ascribed to Jesus and that it represents later the Catholic Church tradition. For nowhere in the book of Acts or any other book of the Bible is baptism performed with the name of the Trinity. The Bible Commentary, 1919, page 723, says, the command to baptize in the threefold name is a late doctrinal expansion. Instead of the words baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, we should probably read it simply, baptize them into my name. It's amazing. If you study history, history bears it out. If they don't want to take the word of God as truth, then look at what history says. Look at what some of these cardinals say. Look at what some of the Catholic people and some of these other men that wrote some of these encyclopedias say. This was not in the original manuscript of the Bible. We find later on that this man, Eusebius, also said something else in Proof of the Gospel, book number 3, chapter 7, page 136, or I'm sorry, chapter 7, page 157. The original manuscript was go and make disciples of all nations in my name. And he says in his book, he said that the text, the textual alteration that we see today in our English Bibles was the most severe of any falsification to the gospel. And he denounced its addition to the modern text. Falsifying the word of God just so they could at that time establish their own political agenda. They wanted to rule more. They wanted to take control of more, so they changed the formula of baptism. Let's look at some more history examples. The original form of words were in the name of Jesus Christ or Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism into the Trinity was a later development that came from Scriber's Dictionary of the Bible, volume 1, page 241. In Canning Encyclopedia, page 63, the early church was always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus until the development of the Trinity. Afterward, they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. After a man-made idea. Dictionary of the Bible by James Hastings says this. It must be acknowledged that the formula of the threefold name, which is here enjoined, does not appear to have been used by the primitive church, which so far... As our information goes, baptized in or into the name of Jesus Christ or Lord Jesus Christ without any reference to the Father or the Spirit. Encyclopedia Britannica says everywhere in the oldest sources it is stated that baptism takes place in the name of Jesus. So if you go back and back into the olden times, everywhere in the oldest sources they were always baptized in the name of of Jesus. Christian baptism, according to Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion, Christian baptism was administered using the words in the name of Jesus Christ. The use of the Trinitarian formula of any sort was not suggested in the early church history. The Trinitarian formula and triune immersion were not uniformly used for, or from the beginning, nor did they always go together. The teaching of the apostles indeed prescribes baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But on the next page speaks to those that have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The normal formula of the New Testament is baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was changed in the third century. And it goes on. There's even more. The Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition talks about the same thing. How that it was changed. And you can see through all of these references.
experiences. It's one thing for them to say, well, so-and-so had a dream, or you know, we changed this in the Council of Nicaea in AD 3, whatever it was. It's amazing that they take what was done by man and they base their faith on it. But we cannot afford to have our house built on the sand. Because when the winds come and the waves come and the winds come crashing on that house, it's going to fall. And great is the fall of it. But we need to make sure that our foundation is built upon the rock because the winds are going to come. The waves are going to come. They're going to beat on the house. But as long as we are founded upon the rock and as long as we are founded of Jesus Christ, and as long as we are founded on the apostles' doctrine, we are never going to be led astray, and our house is going to stand. Amen. Going to stand the test of time. Even secular and religious literature is a lot. All these encyclopedias and all this stuff agree that the original formula of baptism was in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 3. Verse number 17. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Right there should be proof enough. We pray in Jesus' name. We cast out devils in Jesus' name. We pray for the sick in Jesus' name. So why in the world shouldn't we baptize in Jesus' name? Whatever you do, word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none, uh, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation does not come in the title. There is no other name that can save us. Even if Matthew 28, 19 wasn't changed. It says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We know the name of the Son is Jesus. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. There you go. And Jesus said, the Comforter, whom I send in my name. So even if they don't want to accept the fact that that scripture was changed, Jesus, I, I don't know if he saw this in the future or not. But he made it clear that even if they want to alter the word of God, the way that they altered it still proves the fact that you must baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. The devil can try to twist whatever he wants to twist, but Jesus with the forethought all these years later knew and understood that the devil was going to try and corrupt the name of Jesus and try and corrupt the formula whereby we must be saved. And he planned it out. So there was no way that anybody could have any other thought. Immersion. So that takes care of the name issue. Immersion by baptism. It's the only biblical example. We talked about that just a little bit, but let's go in a little bit more. Purpose of baptism. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. The following Jesus, we know, is very important. We've got to understand that following Jesus does not stop at the cross. But we've got to follow him all the way. Jesus didn't stop at the cross, but if you look at his life, he went on to a tomb where he was buried. And then he rose again. So we've got to follow him. We can't just take up our cross and follow him to the crucifixion. We've got to make sure that we follow him all the way through to the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We have a hard enough time crucifying our flesh and mortifying the deeds of the flesh, but we've got to make sure that we go further and follow what Jesus did, his example. So Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of of the Father, even so also we should walk in the newness of life. We are buried with him in baptism. When you bury somebody, you don't throw a few shovel full of dirt on their head and just say that they are buried and leave them lying there. That would be nasty. It would stink. That's what they told Lazarus. Lord, don't move that tomb out. He stinks. We had a bunch of, if our cemeteries were full of people that weren't buried, there would be lies and disgusting stuff and it would stink and it would just be a terrible 
place. But he said, you've got to be buried, just like we bury somebody six feet under. Now, when you're baptized, we don't push you down six feet and then let you come back up because that's where we bury people. As long as you are fully covered, you are buried. So we've got to be buried with him by how? By baptism into death. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 12. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Once again, it's not just one example, but there are two examples that show that when they were baptized, they were buried with him. Meaning they need to go under the water. They need to fully go under. So, deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow him, go all the way, go to the burial, get yourself buried. Once you get buried, then you can have the resurrection, which we'll talk about later. Baptism. Another purpose of baptism, we need this washes away our sins and remits them. Acts 2.38, we already read it, but he said, be baptized, every one of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But why are you baptized? For the remission of sins. Luke chapter 24, verses 47 through 49. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father among you, tarry ye in Jerusalem, so you be do with power from on high. That repentance and remission of sins could also be said that repentance and baptism should be preached in his name. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now, why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When he was talking about getting this guy baptized, he said, why are you waiting? Get up, get baptized, because you need your sins washed away, calling on the name of the Lord. Because baptism washes away our sins, nobody should wait to be baptized. Because it washes away our sins, nobody should wait to be baptized. It's so important. Baptism is so important that we find in the scriptures that people rearrange their schedules and they did everything they could for the reason of being baptized. If you look at Acts 2.38, Peter thought it was important. We know that. The Ethiopian eunuch thought it was important in Acts chapter 8. We've referenced it about baptism before in, in this uh, teaching this morning. In Acts chapter 8, 26 through 39, I'm not going to read all the scriptures this morning for the sake of time, but... He thought it was so important that he stopped and got himself baptized. Peter commanded Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Peter was just preaching the word. The Holy Ghost fell. They began to speak in other tongues. And Peter said, hey, we got some water. Why don't, why don't you just hop in the water and get baptized? He didn't say, let's think about it and come back next week, next Sunday. He said, you've got to be baptized right now. So he got them in the water, him and his house, and they got baptized. The Philippian jailer was baptized the same night he thought to commit suicide and take his own life in Acts chapter 16, 31 through 33. It was so important that, that the jailers, they said, look, you, if you're thinking about doing something that's so wrong, but Jesus loves you, he died for you, let's get baptized in Jesus' name. Let's get the sins washed away. It was so important to Paul that those Ephesians, or at the Ephesians, that those all were re-baptized after hearing the new message in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. We find in John chapter 3 that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, you know, what, what do I got to do? And he says, well, you got to be born of the water. You got to be born of the spirit. So why is baptism important? Because it's necessary for salvation. Peter said, repent and be baptized. All throughout the Bible, look at the book of Acts. From there on, talks about they were baptized with Jesus' name. It was important. It's not something that people, people will say this thing. It's just a, it's just a, uh, oh, what did he say? Slip my mind. Yeah, just a sign. It's an outward sign of an inward thing. Well, it's an outward sign to some people, but you've got to crucify the flesh. You've got to repent of your sins of death. You've got to have a burial. You've got to be baptized, and you must receive the Holy Ghost. How else can you obtain resurrection power if you are not dead? You cannot revive somebody who is not dead. It's hard to do. 
you can come up and try to revive me and it looks cool and I'll be breathing and everything, but you'll probably do more damage to me because I'm not dead. You start CPR and you start pushing on the chest and you start doing all this stuff. I'm not dead. I, you know, I, you don't resurrect somebody who's not dead. You need to go through and follow what Jesus said. Jesus said in uh, Mark 16, he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He didn't say he that believeth and does this as an outward sign of an inward feeling. That's not what he said. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So Nicodemus goes back to Nicodemus. He says, what do I got to do? He said, you got to be born of the water. You got to be born of the spirit. And he said, well, how am I going to? You got to be born again. He said, well, how am I going to get back into my mother's womb? That'd be crazy. You can't do that. He said, we got to be born of the water of the Spirit. He said, if you're not born of the water, then you cannot even see the kingdom of God. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Amazing. You can't even see it. And then he says in verse number 5 of John chapter 3, if you're not born again, you cannot enter. First he says in verse number 3, you can't see it. Then he says, okay, if you don't believe that, I ain't going to enter the kingdom of God. You can't enter it, and you cannot see the kingdom of God if you are not baptized in Jesus' name. You've got to be born again. Why is baptism important? We talked about remission of sins. Baptism, it says when you are buried with him, that you are the old man. Whoever you were before, and all the sins that you committed, all of that stuff stays in the water. The Bible says that you come up a new creature in Christ Jesus. Some of those, and all those sins are washed away. All that stuff stays buried in the tank. And when you come up out of the water, and maybe, some of you haven't been baptized in a long time. And it's not, by the way, this is something you have to do every week, is get baptized once in Jesus' name. But if you remember that experience, some of you, it's been 20, 30 years ago. Some of us, it was a few weeks ago. If you remember that experience when you were baptized in Jesus' name, and you came up out of the water, big old smile on your face, hands usually just fly up in the air. How are you feeling? I feel fantastic. I feel the weight of the world just fell off my shoulders. Well, of course it did, because all the sins that you were carrying were left down here in the water. It's left in the tomb, but now you're up and you're a brand new person in Christ Jesus. You have been born again. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You are a new person. You're no longer that drug addict anymore, but you are a new person in Christ Jesus. You're no longer the cheater and the stealer and the, the fornicator and those that lie and backbite and do all this evil stuff. You're not that person anymore because that person is still in the water and you come up, you're a brand new person in Jesus' name. That is why baptism is so important because the weight that you carry is going to hold you back. It doesn't allow you to run the race very well. But if you can find a pit stop and get into the water and get baptized in Jesus' name, get the weight off of your shoulders, then you can have forgiveness of sins and you can be a brand new person. Galatians chapter 3, 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I just want to put on Jesus Christ. So we can see in the scriptures the importance of baptism. Great emphasis was added and placed upon the mode of baptism. Immersion. We read three or four different scriptures about immersion being buried with him. And the formula of baptism. I read you uh, quite a bit of historical references that says how that, that formula was changed. So nobody can tell you. And if you want the notes of all those historical stuff, let me know. We'll print them off for you. But nobody can tell you that that is the Bible way. Because that formula is not the Bible way. The mouth of two or three witnesses. I've got enough. I've got more than two or three. We've got enough people that said that is false. And even if it wasn't, like I said, the Bible clearly states that the name of Jesus. So there's great emphasis upon the mode and the formula. But the harmony, look at what was done. Peter preached the message. And then Paul confirmed the message. When Peter preached baptism, he talked about being baptized in Jesus' name. Well, when Paul preached about being baptized, how did he preach? Being baptized in Jesus' name name. There was harmony throughout the New Testament about how we were to be baptized. And the Spirit of God confirmed the message over and over again. So for us today, it is important for
for us to maintain and stay on the same path that the apostles laid because they laid the same path, they walked the same path that Jesus laid. Repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We're not following a doctrine that somewhere down the road was changed or altered, but we are following the original message that was preached by Jesus and Peter and Paul and you name all the rest of the apostles. It was preached by them. It was never stopped all throughout history. There's always been a group of people that believe you must be baptized in Jesus' name. You've got to go under the water. And you must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We talk about the Azusa Street. We talk about, you know, some of those things. Or Topeka, Kansas, where there was a great outpouring of revival and a revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, there was a revelation, but it never ended. It seemed, people seem to think that it ended and it was re-poured out. It never stopped. There was always a group of people that believed in Jesus' name, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But if you look across, there's so many, I'm running out of time, there's so many religions and so many uh, doctrines that say you can be baptized in the Trinity. And we already talked about oneness, but why would they want to mess with that? Because the devil, if he can do one thing, if he can mess up one thing, it would be the mode of salvation. If he can mess up one thing to get as many people to hell as possible, we think of murdering and we think of society, how bad it is. And yeah, the devil's working on that. But if there was one thing to get a mass group of people going to hell, it would be, let's hide the secret of salvation. Let's not let them know what it takes to be saved. But I thank God that when I was seven years old, somebody told me that I must be baptized in Jesus' name. And I must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I did do that. On February 28, 1992, I was baptized in Jesus' name. Going under the water and I froze my rear end off. That water was so cold. And I thank God that I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. August 14th, 1992, 20 years ago, last Tuesday, I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in another tongue as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. And I'm thankful that I was baptized the Bible way. The Bible way. Not man's way. Not something that somebody created. That somebody decided to come up with one day in a dream. I'm thankful that I was baptized the Bible way. Would you stand with me today? Doctrine is so important. We need to make sure that we understand why we are baptized. Why we need to be baptized. And why we baptize the way that we baptize. There needs to be an urgency in the hour of how we baptize. And trying to get as many people in. Not for the sake of numbers and throwing them in the tank to get them baptized. But understand that the Bible clearly says if we are not baptized the correct way. If you change your altar, it's going to... Salvation is not something that you want to play around with. So, you know, you just can't do what you want and expect to have the end result that you want. We've got to make sure that we get people baptized in Jesus' name, that they receive the Holy Ghost, which we'll talk about uh, next week or something of that nature. Amen. We love you. Let's lift our hands right now. Father, we love you and I thank you. God, for the revelation of truth, I thank you that the doctrine that we follow, God truly is from the beginning, that it is something that was set from the foundation of the world. That there is one Lord, there is one faith, that there is one baptism. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that I know the baptism, that I have done that baptism. God, that I have been in the water, I've been baptized, I've been immersed. I was called upon in Jesus' name when I was under the water. They said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that we do it how you told the apostles to do it. Go and baptize in your name. And God, I pray, help us to hold on to these truths. Help us to hold on to this doctrine so we can be a light in this world. I pray, God, just bless us today. Hallelujah. Let us get the word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. That we would be able to give an answer to those that would ask us at any time. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We love you. If you need to grab a drink of water, use the restroom, shake hands with one another. We'll start our next service here in just a, a few moments.